Here we want to discuss maxima and minima. One of the best things about calculus, in fact one of the reasons why so many different majors need to take calculus, is because it allows us to find the maximum and the minimum of a function. And that's a hugely valuable thing for mathematics to be able to do, right? If you can find the maximum or the minimum of something, that really makes an impact, right? Just imagine um, some, some kind of company. Can you maximize revenue? or minimize loss, or maybe you're doing some kind of engineering project, can you minimize the friction or can you minimize the heat loss? Can you maximize efficiency of some process? Can you minimize the number of steps a computer program takes to run? Right, so much of what we do in the world can be boiled down to maximizing or minimizing something. So I encourage you to think of whatever field you're going into and how some of the biggest challenges or problems in that field can be reduced essentially to exercises in maximizing something or minimizing something. Well, we spent all this time developing this theory behind the derivative. How does that apply to maximums and minimums? Well, it essentially comes down to this fact that where the function goes up and turns around, if we compute the slope of the tangent line, what is the slope of the tangent line right here? it's zero, right? That's the whole thing that really ties it all together. That simple fact, well, if the slope of the tangent line is zero, that tells us that f prime of this, we'll call this point c, right, on the x-axis, so f prime of c equals zero. So if we can find the places where f prime of c equals zero, we can potentially find the maxima and minima of a function, and once we can do that, we bring something seriously valuable to the table when it comes to real world applications. Now this is a slight oversimplification. There's a little more to it than just finding where the derivative equals zero and, and plugging those in, but that's essentially the main idea. So let's look at this function over here to the right. I've drawn a simple function just to get some definitions. So in this function here, uh, this top point, the very highest point, is what we'll call the absolute maximum. And we'll define this more rigorously shortly, but essentially what it means is this the biggest point, the biggest y value anywhere on the graph, right? There's no other point on this curve of f of x that goes higher than that absolute maximum right there. Similarly, we have an absolute minimum down for the lowest possible point. Now we also have two other points of interest in this graph, this little bump right here and this bump right here. These are what we call local extrema. So we have a local maximum here where it goes up and then comes back down. And we have a local minimum where this thing goes down and then turns around and goes back up. And you can see clearly that at the local minimum and the local maximum, the derivative at those points is zero. Okay, well that's a nice introduction if only every function were that simple. Let's consider another function. Okay, here's a function that's slightly less well behaved, and we have some differences here. We still have our absolute minimum, and we still have a nice local maximum where the derivative equals zero. But right down here, where the graph gets pointy, we also have a local minimum, but we know that the derivative of the function is not defined at, at so-called corners like that, where the graph goes pointy and turns around and comes back. So this is indeed a local minimum, but the derivative is undefined. But that tells us not only will we need to look for places where the derivative equals zero for maxes and mins, let's just zoom in here, but we're also going to need to look for places where the derivative is not defined to give our maxes and mins. Or we could also say that the derivative does not exist at those points. So you can probably already imagine how that makes our calculations more complicated to say the least, as we'll see in several examples. Okay, there's one more strange thing happening with this second function here. Note that as we move further and further to the left and we go up and up and up, it never actually reaches the top of the function here, right? I have this open circle which means that we never actually get there. So if the circle was filled in, we could say that this is the absolute max, it's whatever point that this circle is. But since it's an open circle, 
this function gets ever and ever closer to that, but never quite hits it. So we would say that this function has no absolute maximum. And you can dig down pretty deep on this idea of getting ever closer to a point but never reaching it and how this function doesn't actually have a maximum, even though you can see what the maximum would be if that point was filled in. Um, there's a whole class that you take on this if you become a math major called Real Analysis. And you just spend some time really examining what that means on a deep mathematical level to get infinitely close to something but never arrive and what that can mean for something like the maximum. Um, so all you math majors out there will take that kind of course. And honestly, a lot of other majors that kind of take a minor in math or something like that also take a course in real analysis. It's a great course. It's one of the staple courses for any math major. Okay, well, let's tighten up some of these definitions a little bit. Okay, so definition. Let f be defined on a set d with c in d. So c is some number in that set d. All right, don't worry too much about this d. You can just think of this d as the domain. And if you want to use the fancy mathematical notation for this kind of situation, you would say C is an element of D. We use this kind of uh, epsilon looking thing. It's not quite an epsilon, or it's, it's a certain kind of epsilon. You have multiple epsilons. You have a lot that look like that in, in mathematics. But this one is a specific kind where it's a uh, more of a smooth arc with one little line through it. C is in the set D. Uh, but we'll just say in for now. Okay, so back to the definition. If f of c is greater than or equal to f of x, for every x, for every, so for every x in the set d, then we say f of c is an absolute maximum. Okay, so what this means is if f of c, so we'll call this point c, so something like that, if f of c is bigger than, oh, we'll call it f of c, is bigger than or, or equal to, so greater than or equal to all other f of x, for any other f of x. So no matter where I pick x, this f of c is bigger than all the other ones, f of x, for all x. We could write this as upside down a. That's, a, that's the better way of writing for all or for every x in this interval d, or this domain. It doesn't even have to be an interval. Um, so it just this is just a really fancy way of saying f of c is the biggest point, right? We're just making it mathematical. Okay, on to the next definition here. It's very similar. If f of c is less than or equal to f of x for every x in the domain, or in d, then f of c is an absolute minimum. And again, if you like the mathematical notation, for all x in d. More compact way of writing that. Um, but same idea, right? If it's the smallest point, it must be a minimum. Okay, for the third definition, we have if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all values of x near c, then f of c is a local maximum. Okay, so let's interpret this one. What this means is you essentially have a small bump that gives you a, a, a little maximum right here. So this, this is our c, and it says, okay, as long as we're near c, c is the biggest thing, right? Now, granted, there's bigger stuff happening over here to the left, and that doesn't matter. We're talking within, within a little neighborhood of C is what we would say mathematically. So you can just think of the local maximums and the local minimums of the little bumps in the graph that give you kind of many maxes and many minimums. Now, you may be saying that all values of X near C doesn't sound very mathematically rigorous. And right now it's not. And again, I encourage you to take that course in real analysis where you really dig down on what we mean when we say X is near C, right? It's really quite amazing how you can work out these definitions and what we mean by near something and put it on a more rigorous mathematical footing. Okay, and finally, if F of C is less than or equal to F of X for all values of X near C, then F of X is a local minimum. Okay, so then same thing again. We're looking for the small bumps. How about that? There's two local minimums, just little bumps like that. Oh, it also has two local maximums. What do you know? Okay, so that's, that's what we mean. We just needed to say it in a little more mathematically sound way. Okay, next we have a theorem. Okay, the extreme value theorem tells us that a function continuous on closed interval AB has an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum on that interval AB. 
And if you don't believe this theorem, just try to draw one that's continuous on a closed interval. That means it's defined on every point on that closed interval that does not have an absolute maximum or minimum, right? Any function you can draw, let's draw one. Okay, so we're defined everywhere on this interval a, B, and it's continuous. So no matter what we do, I don't know, maybe make it sharp, make it curved, whatever we can possibly do, uh, we're still going to have some absolute maximum. It might be at the endpoints, but here we can see, well, here's our max, and here's our absolute, here's our absolute max, here's our absolute min. But you can imagine another function, maybe that comes in like this, and goes off like so. So now our absolute maximum is right at the end point. Here's our maximum at A and our minimum somewhere down here. But uh, you know, if you imagine just cutting this function off at these endpoints, it still has a, an, you're still guaranteed to have an absolute maximum um, even if it's at the endpoints. Okay, we need one more definition to really be set up for this section. If you recall from before, we said that a function could have these local maxima and minima or maximum points and minimum points, where the derivative was either equal to zero or does not exist. Okay, well, we call these C values down here on the x-axis critical points. So it's good that we chose C for them. Critical points down on the x-axis are these points for which the function has a derivative of zero or a function that does not exist. So here's the full definition. A point C in the domain of f of x and I note here that it must be in the domain. That's going to be an important thing to check. Okay, at which f prime of c equals zero or f prime of c does not exist is called a critical point of f. And it's a little confusing because we call it a critical point, but here we're only talking about the x values. So up until this point, when we say a point, we need an x and a y value. And this is even a, a fairly confusing point throughout the mathematical literature because some books do it slightly differently. But for us, We'll talk about these critical points as simply the x values. We don't need the y value to complete the actual point itself. We're only looking for the x values and we're calling them critical points. So I guess we'll say the point C in the domain of f, in the domain of f of x, that tells us that we only need x values. Just to define what we call the critical point. Of course, we'll be very interested in the y values as we move forward, but just in terms of saying what the critical point is, only need the x value. Let's do an example. Okay, it's always nice to move from a ton of new theory and definitions to a, an example that we can actually compute something. So this is a, just a nice example to get us started. It says, find the critical points for f of x equals x cubed plus 6x squared minus 15x. Okay, so we need to take the derivative and find the places where that derivative equals zero or does not exist. Well, we can do that all day. We just hit it with the power rule here, so f prime of x is clearly 3x squared plus 12x minus 15. And now we're going to set this equal to 0 and solve for x. Now, this bit of algebra is fairly straightforward, but you can imagine how this could get very complicated very quick because some of the derivatives are very involved. And when you set those equal to 0 and then have to solve for x at the end, suffice it to say we're going to really tax our algebra skills throughout these next few sections. And that's okay, right? Again, the, one of the main points of calculus is to master our algebra skills. So that's kind of what we'd expect. And by the end of this chapter, I think you'll be pretty good at algebra. That's for sure. Okay, let's solve this thing out. Um, rather than jump right into factoring, which we could do, I'm going to factor out a 3. Look at that. x squared plus 4x minus 5. And then this thing factors right down. 3. How about x and x? plus 5 minus 1, that does the trick, equals 0, which gives us x equals negative 5 and 1. Negative 5 and positive 1. And those are our critical points.